can mean, obviously we're going to pick, we're going to pick like we pick for our children. Uh, we're going to pick pet people. You know, I know exactly who I want to have my three dogs. Um, but I'm also going to give them, I want them to have money because vet bills and I want them to have a great life. Um, and all the things that a great dog, all our great dogs deserve. Hello, and welcome to WooStream, bringing Willamette to you. Thank you for joining us tonight for what we hope will be an informative look at some basic estate planning documents and why it is so important to have them in place. Joining me tonight is Susan Cook. Susan is a 1996 graduate of Willamette College of Law. She's been in private practice for more than 25 years here in Salem, where she focuses on estate planning and elder law. She's been a professor of law at our law school since 2001. She oversees our clinical law program for estate planning and teaches classes in trust and estate and elder law. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we need to be prepared. But some of those preparations, such as estate planning, can seem daunting. You may hear the word estate and think of a mansion and acreage, but the reality is, is that if you have a house or a car and a checkbook, you have an estate. And it's very important to have a plan in place to carry out your wishes for it. So what happens if I don't have an estate plan in place? Then the probate court in your county is going to handle what happens to your assets and more importantly, your children. And it may not be the outcome that you would have chosen. To do this, the court follows your state's intestacy laws, which basically are the laws that govern when somebody passes away without a will. Okay, I've talked you into it, you need one now. But what is an estate plan exactly? An estate plan is simply a collection of documents that protects you and your family and your assets and explains your wishes for them after you pass away. It also specifies exactly who will guard those wishes and act on them in the event that you become incapacitated or pass away. To move us into this next part of the conversation about the different documents, I'm going to bring in Susan now. Susan? Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. That was a great introduction. I think this is, is, is such an interesting time to be considering estate planning in, in light of the year that we've had, especially here in Oregon. We've had a global pandemic. We've had ice storms. We've had wildfires that have kept us inside due to air quality, all of these, these interesting events in life. So I'm happy to be here today to give you an overview and some basics. Um, we're just going to start with 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 what is a will. I think that's pretty common in terms of people's knowledge base of, of what a will does. But it, it it is it is there are particulars to it. It is it is an important written document that you sign that ha each state has its own individual formalities associated with it, whether it's two witnesses witnesses or three witnesses. Um, it gives you a lot of the ability to let the court, let your family, let your friends know who you want to receive your probate property after your death. This can be your friends, this can be your family, this can be charities and organizations. And in Oregon, we even have a pet trust. So you can even think about your four-legged families. I have three, so they'll definitely, they're definitely a consideration in mine. Um, and then it also allows you to name an important person known as a personal representative or at some states call it him, them an executor. And they are the person appointed by the court who carries out your instructions in your will. And the other part of a will that's really important to people is the designation of a guardian. If um, in the unlikely event something happens to both of you, who is going to be providing care for any minor children who are in your household? So then there are, it's important for people to understand there are things that a will cannot do. Um, uh, we call it an estate plan, an estate planning process, because it is, it's broad and there are a lot of mechanisms in place. So for one thing, a will cannot designate what happens to life insurance proceeds or retirement plan proceeds if they have named beneficiaries. Um, a will can also cannot control what happens to any property that is held in a trust or is held in joint ownership with another owner. The one common misperception I see in my practice is 
the belief that a will avoids probate when in fact the opposite is true. A will will go through probate. Um, the court will be involved in overseeing the, 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 um, overseeing the personal representative's actions and carrying out your wishes as you set forth in your will. So next slide. So let's talk about the most common form of estate planning these days is what's called a living trust. And, and a trust is, is a, is a mechanism of transferring property in a way that allows your property to be managed during your life. It can be for your benefit or it can be for the benefit of someone else. And the way a trust works is that it actually owns your assets and it manages them while, while you're alive. Um, you actually can be the one in charge of that though. So, um, this, the reason that a trust allows you to avoid the probate process is because it is a separate legal entity that contains the assets that would otherwise have gone through probate. Um, you're also able to name your trust as a beneficiary in your will, which is a special kind of will called a pour over will, which allows just in the unlikely event that something's left out for everything to pour back through into the revocable living trust. The wonder, one of the wonderful aspects of a revocable living trust is that it is private and it does not require any filing fees or any pleadings to be filed with the local court, the local probate court. Next slide. So is, is it quicker, Susan, would you say? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. There is a perception that it would, uh, things would go faster, but the reality is the same duties that are required of a personal representative are also required of a tr as a, of the trustee. So the trustee still needs to, 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 to go through a creditor check process. And it is advised to, to basically do everything you would do in a probate, just not with the court supervision. So, um, most of the time, no, it's not, um, it's not a way to receive distributions from the estate faster if the fiduciary is interested in making sure that all of those, all of those um, details are taken care of. So that is usually advisable. I'm not sure everyone does who's not under um, the, um, who's not listening to their, their lawyers, but it is advisable because creditors are still creditors and they're still there even though it's a revocable living trust and not a will. So yes, yeah, so there are some things that a trust can't do. One thing it's important to understand is that you still have the same amount of control over your trust assets as you do you did prior to the formation of your trust, and you can use them with the same degree of flexibility. Um, one thing a trust does not do is avoid estate taxes. There is that misperception. So um, if an estate exceeds the federal li limit of $11.7 million, um, the trust will not have any magical qualities to, to make that tax a liability go away. We also here in Oregon, we have the lowest um, inheritance threshold in the country. I think we only have one other state in our country. I think it's Massachusetts that has a million dollar threshold for our inheritance tax. And the other thing a trust can't do is it can't cover, it's like the will, it can't cover any assets that aren't specifically listed in the trust, just like a will can't do anything about property that isn't probate property. So in revocable living trust planning, you'll have what's called a pour over will, and it will catch any assets that will be left outside of the trust. Hopefully there won't be any assets left outside. Next and so slide. And so those will go through the probate process then. It, if, if they, they fall are, into the yes. pour over will, they, yep, okay. Yes. Absolutely. Or Kathy, they could also be distributed um, to a joint owner or they could be distributed as beneficiary designations too. So, tell so me, they don't necessarily... Tell me a little bit more about that. So it's important to see the big picture in the way that property can be devised. It can be devised as probate property. It can be in the name of a trust and be distributed through a trust or it can be transferred as a joint ownership um, designation, transfer on death, payable on death, or certain assets like especially retirements, traditional IRAs will have beneficiary designations and it's preferable to have individuals named instead of having the um, IRA be an asset of the trust for, for tax reasons. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about a power of attorney. Um, and a power of attorney is an important complement to both of the two documents I just discussed. 
Um, what a power of attorney does is it authorizes a person to handle your financial matters on your behalf in during your lifetime. Um, the good ones are legally active when they're when they're signed so that we don't have to worry about deciding whether financial incapacity is set in or not. But the the point of having them is in case you have a period when you are incapacitated, um, someone else can help make sure your bills are paid, someone in, can step in and troubleshoot for you. Um, it can even be pretty convenient for people who might travel internationally to have the help of someone. Um, and I know that spouses oftentimes rely on them if they're if they're closing real estate transactions and one is not not available. Um, now this will only apply to specific acts. The, whatever is stated specifically in the power of attorney, that's what your agent will be allowed to do. So um, the transactions have to be very, very specific. You can have limited powers of attorney and general, and then even powers of attorney that include special powers that allow the named agent to change things that might benefit them. So what a power of attorney mm -hmm. cannot do is it, oh yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna quickly ask, you had mentioned if it's drafted well, then it is in effect immediately. Tell me a little more about that. I will tell you because in 2009, Oregon passed a springing power of attorney law. In fact, the, the joke is that my elder law class had to tell me about it um, because I think I kind of rejected the idea just uh, in my own practice because uh, we were struggling already with HIPAA and involving the medical community in the in in the determination of whether or not our clients are financially incapable. We weren't having the same level of support uh, after HIPAA as we were before. So um, the idea of a springing power was for me, my feeling is that it's daunting for two reasons, because first we have to figure out, we have to convince the bank that financial incapacity is set in, and it's not easy to convince banks of anything. And that could involve a very expensive um, geriatric psych evaluation, which run at about $1,500. Um, but then second, what I'd say to my clients was, well, why, why do you want a springing power? Um, because the, the problem with the springing power is, is if you wait until you don't have capacity for your agent to have authority over everything in your life, and if they aren't appropriate, you don't have capacity to revoke the power of attorney. Mm -hmm. So it's better to, to have their, their power be, you know, immediate. And I make sure when they sign, my clients understand that it is immediately effective. That's not to say anybody should use it. Um, and we keep in mind that an agent is named under a fiduciary obligation and has to, has to serve in the best interests of the client. And so, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time they do. Um, we just read about the bad ones in the news. So, and then, you know, elder abuse and financial exploitation can take many, many forms. So, we do worry about it though. Next slide. Ah, the advanced directive. This is interesting here in Oregon because we went 25 years with the same statutory form. And then in 2019, we came up with an updated one, but it was temporary and we knew it was gonna change. And just this last month, we now have a new format. Um, advanced directives are available in every state. They are important because they allow you to lay out what your wishes are for medical care and end of life care should you become incapacitated. Uh, many states like ours have a statutory form that we work with um, that allows us to designate the people we want to be able to be our decision makers if we can't speak for ourselves. And then we also get to tell them how we want those decisions to be made. And it's an amazing thing to have. Um, it is a, and it's an amazing gift to your family to communicate those preferences to them. Because my experience has been that it is impossible for children to let their parents go unless they're told that they have to let their parents go. So it's a, it's a great thing. I think it's worked great since it was uh, put into place in 1996 here in Oregon. We do in Oregon now have um, a lot more value-based designations on our new form. So it's going to be very interesting, but anyone who has the old form can just keep that in place. They don't have to necessarily update it. Do you think this new form that ha goes into the weeds a little further on people's values or that type of thing are going to become more common across the country? 
Oregon has has tended to be kind of cutting edge. And I will tell you that from an academic standpoint, my students love it. Um, we practitioners are nervous because we're afraid of the chilling effect um, at the difficulty of making the decisions, we're afraid that it has become even emotionally more difficult to make those decisions. And we, we want these for our clients because they, they, they're very, they're very useful. They're very good for the families that, that have them. They're, they, they just work. Um, they work well. I've seen it on a very personal level. So it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. And yes, it, and my guess is just like many things that happen here, it might, might be a, an, a, a movement. Uh, like I said, my students here, they think it's amazing. And the, we had the, I had the Salem Health chaplain, um, an ethicist and a social worker speak to my will and trust drafting class. And they were really excited about it. She, she did admit that with me that she thought it could be a little more challenging for clients to get through because of the value-based decision-making. It is difficult, difficult questions to have to answer. So you're saying don't shy away from it. Do it anyway, even though it's hard. If you're in Oregon, exactly. got to be done. Okay. It is the best, it is the best gift you can give to your family. It really is. And it is, it is, it, it's very difficult for family to let someone go when they're under those circumstances, under horrible, horrible circumstances. But when they have that document and they, the good kids, I always tell my clients, the good kids will get this done. But, but it's because you're telling them what you want. You're communicating. And that's the important piece is that, that communication piece. Yeah. 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 So it's a good one. It's a good thing. Next slide. Okay, so a couple questions are, if I have an IRA or a life insurance policies, do these proceeds get added to my estate when I die? And the answer to that question is yes. Yes, they do. Um, the, the way that from our... A, can I stop you just for a sec? From a financial course, standpoint, they get counted. But from, course. like we talked about before, you need a separate designation for those forms. Correct. Um, for those docu- for those documents, right. They're Correct. not going to go yes. into your will, into your trust, right. Yes, exactly. You work with your financial planner or your insurance agent and whatever kind of plan you come up with, you coordinate your beneficiary designations carefully to make sure that the, that they, because once they go, they go. But most of the time we don't see those in probate estates because usually they go to named beneficiaries. If there are minor tri- children involved in the planning, then oftentimes we will name, we will in- include um, the trustees so that the trustees can manage the proceeds to avoid a court appointed conservatorship, which is basically a probate, but during someone's life um, and has all of the oh. added administrative complexities and attorney fees. Yeah. Can we? Yeah. We didn't. Let's touch on that a little bit further. So kiddos, if you have kiddos, mm-hmm. you have a will. What do you want to build into your will for the kids? So you what want are to the- build into your will a trust a what's called a testamentary trust. So I've been talking about lifetime trusts and wills can can contain trusts embedded in them that spring into effect after death. Um, And what they do is they allow that money that was to be left for those children to be managed by someone, someone who's been particularly picked basically to parent them, just like we all parent our teenage children and use allocate resources accordingly. And it can be tailored to really meet a family's needs, especially if a family has one child who has more needs than another and there are bigger concerns and there's a lot of flexibility and it's a really fun area of planning because the the, the family members get very involved in it. Um, the good news is that it, it we don't see it. We have, we've, we live in a healthy society and, and you don't see it happen very often where you lose two parents. So even in 25 years, I've never had it happen, but I've planned for hundreds of cases. So, um, but it's important and it's, it's, it's a great way for an 18 year old not to receive a large amount of money and to have it managed for them in a way that gets them to a productive place when they're in their late twenties. So could you also specify, say, you can have this money um, with, you know, if, as long as you're in school or, I mean, what kind mm-hmm. of guidelines can you put around the money for the kids? 
That's a really good question. There's different types of distributions. There's what's called a mandatory distribution. And that's when you say that the trustee has to give the child the money on this date. And that's usually designated by an age, maybe 25. I prefer 30, a little older. But in the meantime, they ha- the trustee has what are called discretionary distribution rights. And that is a very broad standard. Um, usually it's health, education, support, and maintenance. And what that means is that it allows a trustee to fit anything into that standard that the trustee So I always tell clients, if your kids just check all the boxes and go to college and get the job and and the trustee's looking at the remainder of the trust and the the child's only 24 and the mandatory distribution age is 25 and the, the child wants to buy a house, you just use the trust proceeds you know, you discretionarily distribute distribute it and then you dissolve the trust that way. So it's very, very flexible. It gives parents the ability to tailor it to meet their own value system because it's scary. It's scary to plan for what's going to happen to your children if you're not there. And it's a way to feel a little more secure in case something horrible does happen. So say that, say you have a child that has pretty, pretty profound special needs. Correct. What happens then? Yeah. Well, you might have a child who will require uh, public assistance at some point um, in order to supplement their their care. And you might want to supplement that public assistance. Um, A lot of my clients are not in a position to pay privately for the group for group homes, but they want their children to receive a portion of their estate. And they so what they'll do is they'll utilize what's called a special needs trust which is intended to not to disrupt any public assistance, but to provide the extras that um, public assistance does not provide. So things like uh, wheelchair accessible vans, vacations with the other family members, um, computer equipment. Um, so it can be a really nice way for someone who's who's living on the bare minimum to have extra, especially medical devices and, and those types of, um, it's really, it's always interesting to hear how expensive all of those accommodations are for um, developmentally disabled people. So it's a, it's another great planning option for people. And that can be set up either during their lifetime or through your will? Correct. Yes. Every trust, whether it's a a child's trust, whether it's a supplemental needs trust, or whether it's a tax planning disclaimer trust, can be embedded in a will or it can be included in a revocable living trust. They can be in both, either way that a client decides to go. A lot of times, what dictates that decision is how much clients want to spend on their estate plan. That can be a big factor. Let's go to number two. Yes, number two. Yes, where should I store my documents and who should be aware of them? I am a big proponent of safe deposit boxes. and, And I've had some pushback on this because... This has been a trend that has changed since I've been a practicing lawyer. Um, my 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 professor, and when I was here, was was opposed to safe deposit boxes. They, she felt they were difficult to get to. Um, but here in Oregon, our Oregon Bankers Association helped us with some legislation that allows a personal representative to go and seek out the contents of a safe deposit box without taking all the contents, but can just remove an original will. So access has been given a little bit and it's been granted. Um, and in the last year, uh, we are now uh, probating estates where original documents have been ruined by fire. Even if they've been in supposed fireproof safes, they're not. It turns out they're actually not always that safe. So um, I, I am an advocate of safe deposit boxes for this reason. Um, and as far as who should be aware of them, the people who are in charge should be aware of them. Uh, I always make sure there are copies that are made so that um, I even distribute them to the named named fiduciaries if the clients want me to. Uh, I think it is really important to be, I always try to encourage clients to, to be very transparent with their family. I know it's not an easy thing to talk about and family members don't want to talk about their parents dying and I understand that, but they are going to be glad to know that their parents have their affairs in order. And, um, and they should be aware when they're named in a, in a designated capacity, especially healthcare, because that'll be maybe the first to come along, along with the agent on, um, under the power of attorney, or even trustee if it's a revocable living trust. 
Susan, if the people are living in a state that don't have the same kind of guidelines we do on this stuff, on the mm-hmm. safety deposit box, where do you recommend they keep them? Well, then, then so, that would be the the fireproof safe options that, um, and and to yeah. make sure that 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 um, people are aware of the location of the fireproof safe and the and the. Um, whatever the combination is. I, a lot of my clients disregard my advice to put it in a safe deposit box and they still put it in their fireproof safe. So it is a definitely a judgment call on, on clients parts, but um, it is sure nice though, when clients call and they are just panicked because there are no papers because their mother or father has shredded everything to discover okay. that the will is intact in the, in the safe deposit box. So um, it's still like about, they do sometimes people, I had one client say, my father f- fell in love with his shredder. Um, so, and everything was shredded. Everything was shredded. Um, so yes. So I, I always encourage that clients should be aware and, and know that they're named. And um, because what the funny thing is, is that people actually forget they sign these documents. I had it happen with my own husband of 23 years. He was helping me witness a will during COVID because I knew he was the safe person. And he told my client he didn't have an advanced directive. He said, yes, you oh do. My God. We, we signed it 21 years ago, but you have an advanced directive. So people forget. Um, this this is a good segue into the, the next question, which is how often should I review or update my documents? A lot of factors will come into play in answering this question. First of all, we are possibly going to have some legislative changes that will affect the high high income earners and um, assets that have um, unrealized capital gains. So it's it's important to keep your eye on tax laws. More important is big events in life like um, having a baby, um, adopting a child, getting divorced, getting remarried, these big events. I mean, we still see even in this day and age where people go, get divorced and they forget to take their ex-spouses off of their beneficiary designations for their mm. corporate pensions. So um, it is important to, to up, review and update. Um, I, I rack my brain over how to increase access to estate planning, how to get that number higher. So it doesn't seem like such a daunting task for uh, one way I try to do it as I teach here at the law school is to help my students speak in a language that our clients can understand. So it doesn't seem so intimidating. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll improve that with time. That's our goal here at least. So I'm sure it's everyone's goal. So the goal tonight. It is the goal tonight for sure. The next question is what happens to me if I have not designated a representative to handle my healthcare decisions? Well, what happens if no one's designated is that um, if it is my understanding from the hospital hospital here in Salem is that they are very inclusive of the families. I remember that as a, um, I remember when I was in that position with my own mother, that they didn't care who was named first on our, her advanced directive or second. My sister and I were just both included. We collaborated. We had care conferences. Medical professionals want to work with the family um, on those very difficult end of life decisions. And so if a family's peaceful, they're probably all going to get included. The rub is when the family's not peaceful and they disagree. And that's when it really gets difficult. And that's when all of the social workers have to get involved at the hospital. Um, and it gets difficult because they don't have any guidance from from their parent, and it's that guidance. It's the parent telling them what to do and how to make decisions. That's the really important piece. Um, mm. It's it, it's and it's also if one person, it's not everyone is appropriate to serve as a healthcare representative. It's not an easy job. Um, I tend to want my my own healthcare representative to have some medical expertise um, that both my spouse and my best friend who's a nurse possess because I want that level of advocacy and involvement. Um, Some people might shy away from that in your family and be better on the financial side of, of, of roles, so to speak. So it is um, it's good to, to tailor your plan and name appropriate people who fit, who fit into the, the, the job description, so to speak. 
So let's see. And young grandkids I'd like to support through college and their parents aren't great with money. How can I leave a protected nest egg for them? Oh, this is fun. This is good. This is good stuff. Um, because it is, it's a, there is a way and what, what a great help for their kids too, to help the, the support the grandkids. College is so expensive these days. So a, a trust is, is going to be an amazing tool for, for this sort of arrangement that they can also, they can also pay um, d- institutions directly. And it's a huge tax benefit for, for taxable estates. So um, it's a great thing. And if they pay the institution directly, they really know they're getting a good bang for their buck because they not only have a grandchild who's getting educated, but they also know their grandchild's going to graduate and not have the the mountains of student loan debt that a lot of, of, of students have in this day and age. So it's a, it's a wonderful planning technique. They can also contribute to a, a, five, a uh, 529 plan too. Yeah, but I which think, are, I think which are very good. Yes, that's another mm-hmm. option that's available. Yeah. So Susan, we have a lot of great questions from okay. our attendees tonight. So I'm going to just great. start here. Um, it says, the first question is, can, should my checking and savings account be included or owned by the trust? And is that an easy thing to move? Oh, that's a really good question. So yes, mm-hmm. the answer to that question is yes, it should. Um, and then I, in fact, it's interesting that this question would get asked because I just ran into a client of our clinic outside and she had a multitude of, of accounts. And so w- what happens is, that in this day and age with, with modern banking, it is necessary for the clients. We, we ghost write the letters and we, we do everything we can to help fund the trust. But the clients have to go in and actually meet with the bankers for them to really trust that this is it's so funny. Trust, trust the trust. Um, and so the, it, it requires a little bit of, a little bit of legwork for the client. And then, you know, the age of COVID-19, it's been interesting, but the banks have been amazing at making appointments. And she mentioned to me just today, that she finally accomplished, I think she might've had 11, a really big number. That's an unusual number for a plan. So, um, but yes, it is, it is a good idea. Um, and a, a small working account that keeps less than 10, five or 10,000, not a big problem, but the bigger accounts, you, you really don't want anything less than 75,000, uh, in Oregon, anything, cause we have a small estate affidavit process in Oregon. So if a bank account's left out, it's not a huge problem. We don't have to file a full formal probate, but, um, but we would, you know, if it's a bigger account, definitely in the name of the trust. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great. So this is one of the things we're going to talk about. So this is a great question too. What are the approximate costs to draft the non-trust document, the will, a power of attorney, advanced directive, et cetera? Great. So your question was, you said a non-trust? Or just a, so yeah, well, basically can, just kind of the basics. Yeah. So I'm speaking regionally, obviously. I don't know where everybody is. So obviously Salem, we're in the middle of the valley here. We're pretty comparable with Eugene, but I think our costs here are slightly less than Portland up north. Um, and I like to just give ranges. And I, I like to visit with my students who are out in practice just to try to keep up to make sure I'm still in the know on everything. A, a package, a will package that contains a will, a power of attorney, an advanced directive, and maybe even a HIPAA release is probably going to be a minimum of 500 and can be as expensive as, as 2,500. And um, most lawyers will flat rate it depending upon the particulars of the plan. Um, now, a trust is a much more involved process. And so it can start as low as $1,500. I know there are trusts by Salem attorneys that are very, very complex for numerous reasons, second marriages, kids from previous marriage, high-end estates that can be as expensive as 30000 I would say for most people, you're going to be looking at between $1,500 and $2,500 for the cost of a revocable living trust, for a garden variety revocable living trust, maybe 3000 but that would be the range. And it's inclusive of all the documents. And most most of us fund it completely, even the real property with the deed transfers and go strike the letters for you for the bank. So we really try to walk you through the process. We don't just leave you out there and, and make you fund the trust yourself. Perfect. Great. 
we had a question about pet trust. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Oh, yes. I'm thrilled to tell you about it um, because I taught it for the first time this summer and I actually oh. had my will and trust drafting. Yes, and it is great. It's so great. Um, it, we, we do. We have a statute here and it allows for... Um, funds to be designated, caregivers to be designated exclusively for the use of the pet. Um, it's the, it's a really nice trust uh, statute. And of course, I'm going to draw blanks since I didn't prepare specifically as I should have, but I, I was certain that someone important had a hand in it. And it turned out, I learned after the fact, because I was teaching it to my class and I just thought, this is great. I love it. Because I teach trust in estates, which is very broad on a national level. And I was honing in on Oregon. I'm so proud of us that we have this. And it turned out the animal law professor from Willamette was on the committee and helped. So what it does, and it builds in mm -hmm. mechanisms for to, the care and the, and the, to make sure that, they're not, you know, exploited for the money that their lives, you know, you can do so many things for your pets. You can I mean, obviously, we're going to pick, we're going to pick like we pick for our children. Uh, we're going to pick pet people, you know, I know exactly who I want to have my three dogs. Um, but I'm also going to give them I want them to have money because vet bills and I want them to have a great life. Um, and all the things that a great dog, all our great dogs deserve and give direction. And so that it's not confusing and um, it's not a too much of a burden for them. So it's, it's a great mechanism. Any estate planning attorney in Oregon can access the statute and it's new. It's rather new planning, but I'm, I'm very excited about it. I, I think it's a great, we're once again, I'm proud of our state. We're, we're kind of cutting edge. So yeah. Did that answer your and question? I would say yeah, I, I think that's great. And that's I would good. say for the people that are in other other states um, to just reach out to an attorney in your area, an estate planning attorney, and ask if, if, if they ask. Absolutely. Absolutely. I did some research over the summer and I learned that there's even ways to involve your veterinarian in determining oh, wow. um, health issues and designating and making sure, which I, I don't know about everyone else who's a pet owner, but I've loved my veterinarian over the year in terms of trusting, talk about end of life decisions, about when we have to go through that with our pets. So um, it, it can be a really fun process. It's, it's worth Googling and seeing what's out there. So, yeah. So next question, what more do you need when you are filling in a beneficiary designation form? Do you want to put it in trust for a minor? What do you need to say other than just in trust for Oh, that's a good a minor yes. or a good minor? Mm -hmm. It's actually that's a complicated beneficiary designation and and it's it's actually possible. I always work with the planners on that, but it's also possible to avoid probate if all the only asset is, is the life insurance and putting it in the name of the trustee of the trust that's been established can bypass the probate process. And then it, it makes sure that the, you know, it's, it's in the trust and the trustee has to manage it for the benefit of the minor child. Um, I have a little handout that I give to to my clients that specifies it. I think if you Google it too, there's some good language. I've seen the language. I've, I've, I'm always curious about it because I'm always wondering what my clients are doing after I instruct them. So does that yeah. answer your question? It, yeah, it's it's in the tr trustee's name as of, of, of the child's trust, the tr child's name's trust. So can, is it's that a, something we could share, the pamphlet that you have? Is that something we could share with the audience? I'm an, I am an open book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay. Next question. If I am single and childless, what criteria should I consider when choosing my beneficiaries, trustees, executors, etc.? Oh, that's, that's good. To, that's a good question. Well, mm -hmm. when it comes to your beneficiaries, you know, you've got your pets, you have your friends, you have organizations you're passionate about, or you have your, your family you love. Um, that was going to be my priority before I had my kids. Um, we have family members who need, we have family members with special needs who would need the, need the support. That's an idea. Um, also, organizations, if you're involved in organizations that what a, what a gratifying thing to, to do. Uh, you, you can really see the impact. Um, I've administered numerous estates and you can really see the impact that, that, that money has. I always, um, 
we always ask, I always counsel my, my students, always ask, see if they have something that they're passionate about, especially in the contingent beneficiary clause. Because if, if all of their beneficiaries who they want in the unlikely event are gone, do you want it to go to all those heirs who you don't even know who they are? Or do you want it to go to your alma mater or to your, your, to the, the organizations that you're passionate about that you're donating to, you know, just look on your tax return and see who you're donating to and, and include them. Uh, what a great use. And then as far as picking who you want, that's a really good question. Um, that would be something that would be a time when I would consider maybe a bank, um, a professional, someone who's objective. Uh, I'm just going to be honest here. Um, I, I, I have appropriate members of my family, who, but they're very busy. They have their own families. And I myself rely upon, uh, I have a bank designated as my my fiduciary after my husband, of course. I, I believe bank dep- trust departments and also businesses. It doesn't have to be a bank trust department. There are businesses locally who are doing this kind of work. Um, that can be an option that can be available to you. I know financial planners have working relationships. Sometimes they can help direct you and you can have somebody who you name who works in tandem with your financial planner, kind of a multidisciplinary approach. Did that answer all the aspects of that question? I believe so. Yeah. And I would just say too, that I, I have a, a, a friend who um, is in the same situation and has worked with a local, she's an attorney, but she's basically going to be the person handling her estate. And um, you know, if, yep. if, something comes up where she needs some help physically or there's there's a health issue, this person will be carrying out her wishes for her. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's there's a lot of options. And if, right. if you need resources, you are absolutely welcome to reach out to Susan or I for for referrals or ref- ideas on that. Absolutely. Okay. So next question. My wife and I have a Two life insurance policy that pays out with the second death. Am I correct in assuming that the death benefit of that policy gets added to the amount of the second estate, but not the first? So, added to the value of the second estate, not yeah. the first. Yep. Two life insurance That's policy it. pays out with the second death. So... Oh, the second to die. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I've never heard. So it's a joint policy and the first death, there's no payout. And the second death, there's a payout. Am I getting that right? I've never heard that. that. Yep. I think that's how I would. Yeah. Then then that's true. It would be the second deaths would, whenever the payout is, that would be that person's estate that would capture it Mm -hmm. for the purpose of valuing it for tax purposes or, yeah. That's interesting. I've never heard of it product like that oh y'all have great questions this next one's great too how is the value of an asset such as a house determined during probate it's an excellent question Uh, Mm -hmm. everything gets valued in a probate as of the date of death so i'll digress for just a minute and remind everyone that one of the great benefits of waiting to distribute your real property to your beneficiaries till after your death is what's called a stepped up basis. And they inherit your basis in the property and they don't pay capital ga- capital gains taxes if they sell it shortly after you die. So it's valued as of your date of death. Um, in Oregon, if it's a taxable estate, we would have it appraised obviously, but if it's not taxable, if it's under the million, we just use the tax assessed value and then wait until it sells and then adjust our inventory to reflect the sales price. And same with cars, Kelly Blue Book, that kind of thing for mm-hmm. if it's under the estate. Okay, correct. Great. Yeah. Um, so my employer offers access to quote Law Assure. This is a new one I haven't heard of, oh. which is an online service for preparing most of the documents you've talked about. Is this a service you've heard of? Or would generally avoid or recommend. So let's That's talk about all good. of those. Yes, yeah. we'll talk about all of them. We'll talk about. I mean, I love. I'm a huge OPB fan, and and she, you know, uh, what's her name? She's sp- sponsored by them. Um, I I think I think anything is good. Um, I I see, especially with COVID nineteen, the inclination to do that. Um, I have in 25 years seen the errors that have occurred from 
drafting them. And, and that sometimes it's as heartbreaking as grandchildren's don't inherit a parent's share. So kind of big consequences. Um, and I think, um, but on the flip side, I've also seen homemade wills. I can even just call them like on the computer, pull them off form based off the internet. I've seen them work and go through probate and distribute the way they they're intended to. I it's a it's a risk I wouldn't be willing to take myself personally, knowing what I know about the intricacies, um, because I it would be for me difficult to foresee how all of the different scenarios could be taken into account with state specific laws. That would be my concern. What would happen if you had a a document like this that was maybe 80% correct? There was something wrong. You know, it wasn't witnessed or something like that. What happened? it, it, It depends on which state you live in, because I think we have 13 states in our country that have passed the hold harmless statute, which is a way to fix and repair wills and to avoid the very rigid, uh, you know, prior to the hold harmless statute, we had a very rigid black, white wills were thrown out, intestacy kicks in, um, who, who knows who's the personal representative. Oregon has a hold harmless statute. So there, there is some ability to try to fix and repair. Um, it's very, it's a very new statute, but we all said during COVID-19, I guess this is a time when we're going to start testing it because we knew that people don't have access to us and they're doing their own work at home. So, um, if any state can fix it, it's a state with a hold harmless statute uh, and Oregon has that. I know all all the states, but I don't have them memorized, but, um, I have a a little map that I show my class when I teach trust in estates of all the different states that have enacted a hold harmless. So that's what happens. You try to fix it. You try to fix it because ultimately what we want is we want what the testator wanted. We want to figure it out. We don't want just because a formality wasn't met for it to be um, for their their intent to be discouraged at all. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Okay. So then it says, what are the relative merits? We have just a few more questions in a very short amount of time. So we got to do this kind of fast. But okay. what are the relative merits of naming a son or daughter as an executor versus an institution like a trust company? That's such a good question. I I feel like this is, I I feel really divided on this myself because I, 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 I am full disclosure. I have represented a bank my entire career and it has been an absolute pleasure. The work that they do is incredible. My attorney fees are the rock bottom low when I represent the bank because they are so superb at their job. I personally have them named and my children are 19 and 17 and I'm not planning anytime soon to, to, um, to burden my children with the responsibility. And that's what it is at some point. And um, I I just lost my mentor who um, taught me a lot as a new lawyer. And he's he had very, very competent kids, adult kids, but very successful kids who lived in numerous states, very busy families, raising grandchildren, getting them to college. And he maintained um, having a bank as, and it wasn't because his kids were not appropriate. The, one is like a high finance banker or something highly appropriate, but um, just that they, they were busy and it took the pressure off of them from doing it. Um, it is, it's, it's a, it's often a thank, thankless job. It's going to be difficult for um, in families where there is any amount of strife. If one gets picked, then there can be situations. Um, but then I also see the families where they're great and they're very competent and they all kick in and work together like a committee. So it's a, it's a difficult call to make. Um, you, I, I can see so many cases where it can go both ways and work either way. Um, it's going to be, sometimes it might be a matter of whether the kids, the son or the daughter wants to. It is available. It might be, be concerned. What if they're teaching English overseas? Or what if they're like, I have one client whose son lives in Arizona, who's, who has a special needs child and is, is putting all of his energy into that child and just couldn't be, just couldn't do it. And he felt terrible about it, which I don't think he should because there are other options. 
So um, that's a it's a really good question. It's it's an it's a case by case basis, and everybody needs to make that decision. Uh, you, the other option can be you name the kids, and then you name the bank as the third. And if the kids want to opt out, you have the bank as a backup plan. That could work. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so many good questions. Uh, yeah. So. Do revocable living trusts have to be redrafted each time you acquire a new asset, such as a new home? If so, what's the cost? Oh, that's so cute. I just got that question out on the street. That's so fun. Uh, no, absolutely not. That's the beautiful thing about a revocable living trust. They just capture whatever probate assets you own. You just have to fund it. We call it funding. And that, that word is really confusing. Basically, it's just transferring ownership. So um, at the time when you form a trust, you're going to learn some basics about doing that because the attorney who prepares it for you, they're going to prepare a deed for you to sign. So you're going to see how that works and your property is going to get redeeded in into your name as trustee of the name of your trust. And then the, the attorney is also going to help you ghostwrite some letters to your financial institutions and help you instruct. And you're going to have copies of all of those in a notebook, along with some transfer instructions. So it's like you're running a little business kind. I always tell clients, it's like you're running a little business. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but attorneys will help you again, if you don't want to do the work, which I can appreciate for a, a lower cost. And it does not require amending the trust. Um, but I will say this, one of the things I realized during COVID-19 was how nice it is to amend trusts rather than having to redo wills because a trust does not have the two witness requirements. So you didn't, it wasn't as risky for the clients because it was much easier to amend a trust. Um, so it does kind of up the um, preference towards trust for people who are, who feel like doing the work, paying the money. Um, but yeah, so no, you shouldn't have to. It doesn't change. The property that the trust contains will not change the dispositive provisions of the trust. Hope that makes sense. Perfect. I will say too that it's very important if you refinance or something like that, you do absolutely need to make sure that it's been deeded back into the trust because they're going to deed it mm -hmm. out, refinance it, and deed it back. So if Correct. you're doing Correct. something like that, be careful it ends up back in there. Um, Check your deed. Yeah, and, and title companies have gotten yeah. a little more flexible about it lately because it's an additional $91 to have to turn back around. And there was a period of time, I know this because when we were buying our, by building our second house, I suggested to my husband, maybe it's our turn to upgrade. And But the title officer told me they wouldn't transfer it directly into a trust at that time. Well, that was in 2006. So, And I'm seeing now in my clients that the trust companies are willing to do that if they let them know, hey, I have this trust. I want this new house that I'm buying to be put in. And they know how to do it. They know how to write the the deeds the way that they should be. Um, and so, yeah, that's a really important point. It's e really easy to forget you have your trust because it just kind of sits there, you know, and waits yeah. to be useful to you. So um, backing up a little bit to the, if you use an outside, a bank, something like that as your trustee, mm -hmm. charges, fees. Yes, good, good question. And oh, they are, there. Yeah, it depends okay. Yeah, it depends on the institution. It depends on the type of business. Some charge on at an hourly rate. Banks like um, uh, in Oregon, we have Columbia Trust Company, we have U.S. Bank, and we have Piner Trust Bank here in Salem. It's a local bank. They charge a, a 1.4 percent of the assets that they that they manage. And then then there's a different set of charges if they take over as power of attorney. Um, I had a, I had a bank just recently step in for a client of mine who was still alive, but declining rapidly. And they had to do some work for a couple of months and help with their finances. And they utilized their power of attorney instead of the trust because they charged at a lower rate. So they picked to be more economical. Um, and they are very forthright in their charges. So they're, they're great. Trust officers are used to marketing their services. And it's, if I'm working with a client who's considering, I always suggest go and meet with these trust officers. Mm -hmm. I've seen decades of trust officers and the good banks just keep bringing on good, talented people to work with. I, um, certain banks, Columbia Trust, Pioneer Trust Bank, U.S. Bank seem to have really great people. Um, so yeah, so um, but always you always want complete transparency as to their costs and their fees. So I think we've covered the majority of oh. these 
questions. Good. There's been so many good ones. Good. Uh, if glad. you have additional, I think we have a slide here that has our contact information. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we are happy to answer your your questions. Um, Susan, thank you so much for your time tonight. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's a enlightening. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm happy to happy to talk. So yeah, thanks for including me. It's an honor. It was great. So this program okay. is going to be recorded and available on Willamette's Woo Stream channel, YouTube channel, along with a lot of other great programs. So please check that out. We're also going to be sending out. I'm happy to share the slide deck that we used tonight. We're also going to be sending out kind of a just a fact sheet that includes a lot of the information on the on the slide deck to folks that um, attended tonight. Thank you all for joining us, and I think that's it. Good night. Thank you. Good night.